Good afternoon. Afternoon, yes. So welcome to oh lecture nine, not lecture eight. Jeez. Lecture nine on October thirteen, right? Sorry for um, for forgetting to update the um, these details. So today we talk about types and also we talk about lazy evaluation. Both of these features are found inside the language Haskell. So it's a, it's a lecture sort of centered around Haskell. Uh, but we want essentially to learn about these two new uh, concepts. Uh, some of them we've uh, touched on uh, previously, types in programming languages. Um, all right, but today we're going to expand on that. We're going to learn new concepts such as type safety, strong typing, polymorphism, the algorithm for type inference, and everything will be studied in the framework of Haskell. Then also, in the second part of the lecture, which is more going to be more like you know the, the, the last third of the lecture, we're going to talk about lazy evaluation, right? The difference between laziness and uh, strictness, typo there, sorry for that, uh, and we're going to see what purity means, what a pure language means. Uh, Haskell is a pure language, and it's the only mainstream language that is pure. And we're going to look at examples. The concept is relatively simple. However, using it requires skill, and skill is acquired by practice. All right, so you will have to practice uh, as much as you can. We're going to also cover this in tutorial and in the problem set, and uh, we are going to be prepared for the exam in this way. Uh, do remember, sorry, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the lecture, next week, midterm, right? Right here during the regular lecture slot, and the lecture will be made up virtually. Will be virtually made up, right? So I'm going to release a recording which you are to watch later at your own leisure in lieu of the midterm. All right, so types in programming. Uh, what is a type? Um, well, you may find it very similar to the notion of a set. What is a set? It's a collection of objects, right? Finite or, or infinite, doesn't have to be finite. Um, all right, and, and I'm going to tell you why the name type, the concept of types came along. It didn't come up in programming languages for the first time. It came up in the framework of logic. Um, and that's because at the beginning of the century, of the of last century, I, uh, I have to get used to say that, to saying that, at the beginning of the last century, um, logicians were trying to formalize mathematics. That is, to make mathematics writable only by formulas, mechanically, right? Sort of using the reasoning rules that we have learned for semantics. And uh, when they tried to formalize set theory, they discovered a bug in the logic, which is called the Russell's paradox. It was discovered by Bertrand Russell. And he's also the person who introduced the notion of types as a replacement for sets and restricted the notion of uh, sets, right? So let me quickly tell you uh, the paradox because it's uh, kind of cute and interesting and I'm not sure whether you're going to hear about it anywhere else. Um, right? So is there such a set that contains itself? Is that there a set A such that A belongs to A? What do you think? Can we have something like that? You don't think so? Well, can we say the set of all the objects in the universe? Is that a correct thing to say? Is that something that makes sense? Let's call that A. A is an object of the universe. A belongs to A, right? So there must be some sets that belong to themselves. Right? So now we can split the universe into two kinds of sets. All the sets in the universe can be split into two kinds of sets, which are disjoint, right? The sets A of 
sets X such that X belongs to X and the sets B, right, X such that X does not belong to X, right? A union B is the entire universe, right? This is, call it U, right? And A intersection B, obviously, is the empty set. They're disjoint, right? So now the question is, where is B? B is a set of the universe, right? It's either in A or in B, right? So this B, is it in A or is it in B? Well, if I assume that A is in B, sorry, that B is in A, right? It means that B, sorry, B, they do not belong to uh, B, they do not belong to um, X, right? So uh, B, let me assume that B belongs to A, right? It means that B has this property, right? But you see, B is the uh, set of objects that have this property as well, right? So you can see it here. It follows that B belongs to B. Contradiction, right? And vice versa. If I start, I can I can go exactly in the opposite direction. If I start from B belongs to B, I will derive that B belongs to A. This is what we call a paradox. And it shows what? It shows that the theory is wrong. Right? Turns out that when we say the set of all the objects in the universe, when we think that that's a well formulated notion, it's actually not, right? So this guy, Bertrand Russell, came up with the no notion of types. And then they say, well, they, he said, well, every object is of some type. And I can allow sets to be made up only of objects of the same type, right? And there is no such thing as type being of the same type, type T being of type T. Type T is an object, so it must have its own type. He said, well, there exists a hierarchy of types, TK is of, of some uh, uh, type TK plus 1, TK plus 1 is of some type TK plus 2, and, it, and there exists an infinite hierarchy of types, but they cannot, can, cannot be mixed together. T cannot be of type T, right? So this is how the notion of type came about. Remember that, right? So essentially, a type is like a set, defines a set, a collection of objects, right? When we say that X is of type int, we're actually saying that X has a very well-defined range of values. Not necessarily finite. In some programming languages it is finite, but in some programming languages it isn't, right? It's limited by the amount of memory you have. You have infinite precision integers, so the limit is really the amount of memory, um, which has not been shown to be bounded, right? Next year we're going to have more memory, and you're going to install the same Haskell interpreter on that uh, uh, new machine, and you're going to have even larger uh, integers, right? But it's essentially a collection of values, right? That's what a type is. Now, if we have types, right, in sets, we will have subsets. And how do we define a type before that? How do we define a type in general? Do we define it as directly the values? No, not really. In general, we define it by the properties that the object has, by the operations that the object has. So for instance, when we say integer, we want to be abstract. We, in, in a language like C, where it's pretty low level, we're going to say, what exactly is the organization of an integer? How are the bits sitting in the number, right? But in a language like Haskell, we're not that concerned. Integer is a collection of values, all of which can be added together, multiplied together, subtracted together, divided, and so on, right? So it's a set of properties, right? Now, when we have, in, in, in sets, we have subsets, right? Something can be a subset, some set can be a subset of something else, which means that it's enclosed. Here we also have a notion of subtype. And the notion of subtype is important because classes in object-oriented programming also are sort of types. And if we have a class, we can derive a subclass. Now, 
when we say that we have a subtype or we have a subclass, right? We assume that the number of objects in the subtype or in subclass, how are they compared to the ones in the original type? So I have a type T1, and then I have, uh, I have, um, well, that's not, I'm not writing it well. I have a type T1, and that is greater than a type T2. So T2 is a subtype of T1, right? We're saying that T2 sort of has fewer objects. Well, how many properties does T2 have? More or less? More, very good, right? That's a very important distinction, right? So more properties means, means more restrictions, means more objects, right? For instance, I will say that a vehicle is, uh, how should I call it, a device with an engine, right? And then a car is a subtype of the vehicle, and I'm going to say that the car has four wheels, right? So you see, I'm adding a property, and that adds a constraint, and that restricts the number of objects that can be in the subtype. Right? So more properties means fewer objects, means that you have a subtype. It's the same for class, classes and subclasses. The subclass has more properties, therefore fewer objects satisfy the constraints. Therefore, the number of objects in the subclass is fewer than the number of objects in the class. So please remember that. It's important to remember it for the entire uh, couple of lectures that are left. We have three main uses. So we want to name and organize concepts. We want to encapsulate sometimes, right? We create new types to encapsulate information. The second one, which we have discussed at length in some of our first lectures, is making sure that the bit sequences in memory are in, in, interpreted consistently, right? And the third, which also have, we have hinted at, is providing information to the compiler about data man manipulated by the program, right? Now, this can be extended in, a, in, 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 in very many ways, the fact that the bits are, Im are implemented consistently, and we're going to see it today when we talk about type inference um, and, uh, and strong typing, in the context of strong typing. Obviously, what's a type error? When we use a computational entity in an inconsistent manner, right? So we take an integer and we try to call we try to interpret the integer as a function. We try to call the integer, right? That would be some sort of an inconsistent uh, use. But you're going to come back and say, well, but in C that's allowed. I mean, it's not directly allowed. I can't say one brackets. Oh, sorry. I can't say one brackets, right? But I can say, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, void star one brackets, right? So in the end, with a little bit of extra extra uh, effort there, I can do that, right? Which means that in the context of today's lecture, C is not a very good language. It's not strongly typed, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that this is necessarily a consistent use. Nevertheless, do remember that this kind of operation is useful, right? If you're writing a bootloader for an operating system, eventually you're going to execute this operation. You're going to load the kernel from the disk, which is a stream of data, put it in memory, and then call the init, the main function of the kernel, right? So you're going to have a constant, which is the constant where you have loaded the kernel, and you're going to call it. The integer becomes an address, which is called, and a fun uh, an address is interpreted as a function. You may also argue that this is not happening very frequently in a programmer's life. It's not very often that a programmer would write this kind of code. So then it's relatively justified in many languages to uh, ban this kind of usage. But there must be some languages that allow it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to write a kernel, right? or a bootloader. OK, so what we mean by type error is, uh, you know, depends on the language, right? Some languages are much more enforcing and much more uh, constrained than others for the reason of uh, 
being safer. And those constraints will actually reduce the number of bugs that a programmer may uh, put in their programs. So we're talking, one important concept here is the uh, concept of type safety. Right, a programming language is type safe if no, if no program is allowed to violate type distinctions. And a uh, violation of type distinctions was just the one that I showed on the previous um, slide. Right, so more specifically, in situ casts are not type safe. I have a piece of data, right, these four bytes of memory sitting somewhere, and I can interpret those four bytes as, as something completely different, right? It is okay to take those four bytes and put them through a conversion function that returns a result that is of different type, which would sit somewhere else in memory. But looking at these bytes, once I, I designate a type for those bits, right, placed there in memory, that type should not change. If I allow it to change, that opens a can of worms for a lot of bugs. Right? Consequently, pointer arithmetic is not safe, and consequently, C is not type safe. Right? C is not a type safe language. Uh, Java mostly is. So Java, because of reflection, has a few shortcuts by which you can uh, do some of these things. But if you're, you know, the beginner Java programmer with, uh, and, and you, you never find out about reflection, which is one little class, one little uh, class in the library, you will not be able to do any of these things. Now, how do we enforce type safety? We can enforce it, assuming we are in a type safe language, right? We can enforce type safety either at compile time or at runtime, right? So at runtime, we, data is paired with its type during execution, and, and notice that it's not related necessarily to the fact to whether the type is, um, the, the language is interpreted or compiled. An interpreted language can be type safe as uh, well. Um, but it, it, uh, the question is whether we enforce it at runtime or we, can we enforce it at compile time. So first of all, it's not always possible to enforce it completely at compile time. It is always possible to do it at runtime completely and not do any, com any type, uh, uh, type related processing at compile time, but rather do it at runtime, right? But if we do it at runtime, then when we compile the data in, we have to associate a type with it. We have to store it. The storage of the variable is value plus type. And every time when the compiled code performs an operation, before performing the operation, that the code around it has to check whether the types are consistent. It is at, at runtime that you know I'm about to add, and I'm going to see that ah this operand is double, this other operand is an integer. Let me convert the integer into a double, and then uh, uh, perform the operation. Right, and that adds a significant overhead. Right, in general, so such kind of checking would be would lead to slower programs. Uh, nevertheless, it is the type of checking that we can always do. We can always defer to runtime. Now, a more efficient way of generating programs is to perform compile time checking, right? So type consistency is checked at compile time, and then the type is stripped. Once the compiler has satisfied itself that, well, you know, uh, I have, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm checking the left operand of plus, then I'm checking the right operand of plus, I notice that the right operand needs conversion. I generate a code for the conversion and put it there in the, gener in the uh, uh, binary, right? And then the operation is performed, and there's no need to keep the type in the data at runtime. I can take away the type from the data at runtime, right? Since the checking is not done at compile time, only the conversion is done at compile time, the uh, code will be much faster, and the code will also be smaller, right? The problem is that we can't always do it, depending on the language. We can't always do it. So most compiled languages, obviously, if we are in an interpreter, we, there's no compilation time, so this doesn't happen, right? But in most languages, we have a mixture of the two. As many 
uh, type checks are performed as compile time as possible, but some of them will be deferred to um, runtime. Okay? Now, it is possible to devise a language such that all checks, all type checks, can be performed at compile time. And those are languages that we call strongly typed. Okay? Strongly typed languages. They are quite restrictive. And one example of overly restrictive language, but strongly typed, is OCaml. Right? You can't, plus doesn't work. Maybe I should use a different color. Plus doesn't work between an integer and this will result in type error. Right? How, if you want this operation, first of all, the float, uh, the, the, um, the, the addition for floating number is plus dot. And here you have to say float of int. Right? So the compiler will perform no costs for the user. The user has to perform all the costs manually. Right? Which is one reason why, compile, uh, why OCaml is, uh, you know, gets a lot of criticism. Haskell is also strongly typed, right? And by contrast, we have weakly typed languages where some type consistency checks must be done at runtime, right? One example is Java. So it is type safe, but weakly typed. Many type checks have to be performed at runtime. Now, for some of these languages, both of them actually here, it is possible, we don't have to declare the types. The compiler infers the types. Right? So you've noticed that in Haskell, we've never written a type. We can, just for consistency. We want to verify ourselves that we have understood the code correctly. So we write the type of a symbol, and then the compiler infers the types and checks it with the one that we declared and issues an error if they're not the same. Right, just for, for a check of our understanding. But the compiler is perfectly capable of inferring the types. Right? Um, and uh, remember, type inference can be view, viewed as, as a type of semantics. And we're going to see it in a, in a few minutes. It can be defined via reasoning rules. Um, um, it, actually, you know, in many programming languages courses, when, we, when uh, people talk about semantics, they will showcase it via types. We show it, it we showcase it by a via a little compiler, but type types are just another type of semantics. We're going to discuss a particular kind of uh, um, you know uh, types and, and um, uh, a more general one, not not just this very simple one, a, a type of uh, a type system that is um, uh, much more general than the one in C that we are sort of used to. Uh, and and uh, these types are called polymorphic. So we have polymorphism. A symbol may have multiple types simultaneously. And we have seen that already, right? For instance, in Haskell length, right? And, and this is the type typing operator. The length function has the type from a list of any type A to actually uh, um, it will be a number here, right? It's, it will not be an integer. It will be a number here. So notice the fact that this is a type variable. It can be replaced by anything. And the length essentially says that its argument can be a list of anything, right? It's not a list of integers. It's not a list of characters. It's not a list of strings. It's a list of anything. Right? And in this actually makes length having many types. Any new instance of A will create a new type there. Right? Uh, and by this we need we mean poly polymorphism. This kind of polymorphism is called parametric. We can see the type variable A as a parameter. Okay? But there are several others. Um, Ad hoc polymorphism, it's the one that you know from Java and C++. You can just 
provide multiple definitions for the same method with different arguments, right? And that makes sort of one method with multiple times, right? In Java, you can define a function int f that takes int a, int b as arguments, right? And then later you can define double f, right? Having int a, int b, and int c as arguments, right? So, same name, different signature, essentially one symbol with multiple types, okay? So that's what is meant by ad hoc polymorphism, also known as overloading. I can overload, I can give a new meaning to a predefined, to a well, previously defined symbol. And we also have subtype polymorphism, where we say that a new type inherits all the properties of an old type, and to those properties we also add a few new ones, right? And this is also available in Haskell via type classes, but we're not going to cover it because we're covering enough already, right? Just remember. So the, the one that is really interesting is this one because it's general enough. It is available in Java since Java 1.5, right? It has been, Java 1.5 has suffered a major upgrade and since then it gets, it has gotten uh, parametric types. So um, uh, how, how, do we, how do we write that now? Right, nowadays we can write something like list angle bracket integer, right? So this is a valid type. And this list is a predefined type that has an argument here. So I can put inside here any argument and I can create a list of that type, of elements of that type, right? And I can make them integers, I can make them strings, I can make them anything I want. This is a new addition in Java 1.5. And C++ has also some sort of a mechanism for creating parametric polymorphism. Do you know what it is? I should have given an example, but I just realized this morning that I forgot, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll upload a slide later with the C++. Yes? Template. template, very good, right? So C++ templates allow a form of parametric polymorphism. And you may wonder why C++ templates are different from macros. They're different because they can be compiled. Macros cannot be compiled. They can be type checked by the compiler and compiled, and the compiler will keep a template of code that can be used whenever an instance of that template is encountered in the code, right? So whereas for, for uh, macros, there's no type checking, right? The macro is accepted, and it's a text replacement facility. Nothing more than that. All right, um, how about Haskell? How, where does Haskell sit? Well, it's functional, it's strongly typed, it's polymorphic, and later we're going to see that it's also lazy. Uh, all right, it's named after Haskell Curry, which was a pioneer of Lambda Calculus. Uh, it has uh, many implementations. Um, in recent years, the GA GAC is, is the prevalent one, which is quite efficient. It works very much as the C compiler. It actually generates internally a C code that is uh, compiled using GCC. It's very well supported, um, uh, though, you know, for, I mean, like, there's a, there's a group of enthusiasts that are, that keep adding to the system. Uh, so it, it's quite close to a full-fledged system and it's probably quite suitable for using, for using large projects. I, however, don't know of any significant large projects that have been written in Haskell, so it still has to uh, take off in that way. So I'm going to go through some stuff that you already know, just as a reminder, um, okay? So it's expression-based because it's functional, right? So it can be used as a calculator once you open the, uh, um, the interactive environment. Uh, this is how we write functional abstractions, right? And, um, uh, well, it inspired Java generics. Java 1.5 was inspired by Haskell. These are sample interactions that we have all seen. So you see 2 plus 3 will evaluate to 5. 
And uh, sorry for the double backslash. Um, I write in Haskell some t in Haskell. I write in LaTeX sometimes. Some macros require the doubling of the backslash. Some don't. And as I converted from one to the other, I missed a few spots. So this is a single backslash. Factorial. Uh, remember, we have infinite precision numbers. And I did something here that you haven't seen before because it pertains to today's lecture. I, I, I apply this directive, which prints the inferred types for every expression that we evaluate. So from this point on, it, instead of just the value, we also get the type of that value. All right? And we want, we want to uh, experience that. So the same here, right? And the same here. And we're going to see more of this times. Uh, operators are written in fix, as uh, you know already. The interesting aspect is function application, which is something that you're probably you're, you're probably seeing for the first time. So during tutorials, when we talked about Haskell, you've seen this for the first time. So instead of f bracket x, we write f space x. All right. Actually, it's not wrong to write f bracket x, right? It's just that x is bracketed as an expression, and there's still f space argument. All right. And you can take this space as an invisible operator, and therefore, f x y is evaluated as f x, and the result of this applied to y. All right. So f x returns a function that can be further applied to y to return yet a new, yet another result. And this is what we call carried evaluation by, you know, uh, uh, this this uh, term carried uh, comes from Haskell Curry, right, the, the um, um, pioneer of lambda calculus who also gave the name of the language, right? So obviously, you may want to change the application order, right? And in that case, you have to use brackets explicitly. If you want this kind of evaluation, because the application is left associative, then you don't need the brackets. These two are perfectly equivalent. However, if you want first to apply g to y and f to the result of that, you have to explicitly enclose g, y in brackets. All right. So... Um, um, th this simulates current application, right? So we can say fxy is x plus y and let g equals f2. So you see g is a g is a valid function and it can be further applied to 3. So this is f applied to 2 and 3. We can write it in this way and uh, still get the same result. Interactive environment, we've already experienced it in the tutorial, um, right? Uh, so the, at the prompt, we can only evaluate expressions, right? If we want to define new symbols, we have to do it in a separate file and then load the file, right? And um, inside that file, we can have the definitions of new symbols, of course, and operator declarations and data types. This is something that we have seen a bit, but not a lot of. Um, all right, so um, um, how do we interact? Well, this should be in a separate file, saved, right? And then in the interactive prompt, this is a different interpreter, right? We can load the file that was saved, right? And then this symbol becomes defined, okay? And can be, can be evaluated. Uh, the prompt will always tell us which module has been loaded. If we load a file with no module name, the module name is by default main. All right, let's look at a few alternative factorial definitions just to remind ourselves of the language. So Haskell is in fact an equational program uh, language, right? So this that you have seen here is probably more, more familiar to you if you come from scheme as a functional language, right? Sort of resemble scheme. We have an if, and, but we want, often we prefer to write uh, programs equationally as we would do it in mathematics. So we can define a new symbol via a set of equations, and the equations can have guards. This is what we call a guard. 
Okay? Now, notice a very in, in interesting thing. If I call factorial 2 with an integer, I'm going to get the result as an integer. Okay? If I call factorial 2 with a double, I'm going to get the result. It's a double. This is very interesting. Right? This is something you haven't seen in other languages. The return type of the function is changed depending on the input type of the function. So look at the type of factorials. We can apply this directive. It's something that you have seen me typing in the tutorial, but it wasn't explained at the time. right? Um, uh, so I can check the type of factorial, and the system will return this type for us. right? It's from any type A to the same type A. So notice, integer to integer, double to double, right? So A is a type variable, and we're saying that the input type and the output type must be the same. But they're not restricted to a single type. But there's more. The type A that we use here must belong to the class of numeric arguments, uh, numeric types, and the class of ordered types. These num and ord are type classes, right? And this is how poly, uh, uh, polymorphism by subclassing works in Haskell, right? We can define a minimal set of properties and give it a name, right? And then we can say that a type must have those properties. So the type A is restricted, but it's not restricted to a single type. It's restricted. What do we have in num? What do you think we have in num? In num, num says that there must be an addition operation for A. There must be a subtraction operation, a multiplication operation, a division operation, module operation, and much more, actually, bit shifts and so on, right? It provides, um, actually, bit shifts, I think, are not there. But you know, all the basic arithmetic operations. And ordered will say that there must be a less than operation for uh, A, a less than or equal, an equal equal, not equal, greater, greater equal, right? So which these are also these are all types that are reasonable for a numeric type. So this is what we are saying that essentially factorial is not does not have factorial two does not have a unique type. It has a multitude of types. And it applies this consistently. And we want to understand how that works. All right, so now we can specify symbol types when we define a symbol, and it's good programming practice. So for instance, for factorial 3, I'm going to say that factorial 3 that I am about to define must be integer to integer. And then for factorial 3, I'm going to use exactly the same definition as for factorial 2, right? Now the compiler is going to do what? It's going to say, is going to infer its own type for these two equations. And what type do you think it will infer? Well, exactly the same type as for factorial 2, because it only has a single type inference algorithm, right? So it, it will infer A goes to A here. It will see that my type is integer to integer, which fits this. Right? A to A, in, integer to integer is an instance of A to A, right? And then it will say that from this point on, this factorial 3 is restricted to this. Right? The fact that I had this correspondence made the type legal, but from this point on, the type of factorial 3 will be restricted to integer, integer to integer. So I'm essentially saying, I'm essentially saying that I want a more restricted type. Right? Why? Because my intention for factorial 3 is to use it only on integer. If I use it on a double number, that should be construed as an error, and I want the compiler to detect that. Right? So that's a good safety feature. So now, if I apply factorial 3 to 10, I'm going to get the usual result. But if I apply it to 10.0, I'm going to get an error. Okay? The error is quite verbose because it's trying to uh, tell us how the error could be fixed, right? 
but essentially it's an error. So the, comp the program did not compile. It's a compile error. All right? And we can go even further. We can define factorial 4 to be not integer to integer, but be int to int. What's the difference between integer and int? Well, integer is infinite precision integers. And you have seen there where we can easily compile, uh, compute factorial applied to 100. Int is 32-bit integers. All right? So at some point, the, we keep multiplying. There's going to be overflow, and the re result is going to be wrong. But ints, this int type is much more efficient than the integer type, obviously, right? So if we restrict the function to this, which, remember, is still an instance of A to A, right? When we compute, try to compute factorial of 100, we're going to get 0, right? It overflows. Factorial 10 works fine, doesn't overflow. So remember, if the type is not specified, the most general type is inferred, and this is the most general type, right? But if we specify the type, we restrict the type of the function to the type that we have specified, provided that the type we have specified is an instance of that most general type that was inferred. Okay, so we can apply a restriction. Now, what you have seen and resembles prolog is pattern matching, right? Um, and uh, it doesn't work in reverse direction, right? So prolog is even more general in the sense that if I have two arguments in one call, the first argument can be input and the second argument can be output. And then in another call, the second argument can be input and the first argument can be output. That doesn't work for prolog, right? So whatever we specify as argument is input and has to be bound, has to be, have a definite value. And the, at the end of the computation, the function returns a result. But still, we can match complex data types, so pattern matching is very powerful as a programming tool. Infix operators. So we like this thing about changing syntax, right? And we've done it in Prolog extensively. So let's see how we can define new operators in Haskell. For instance, uh, we could define an operator, an infix operator, which we call double star. And we want double star to have this type, integer to integer to integer, right? And we define the double star. This is the equational definition, right? x double star y is defined to be as uh, x squared plus y squared. We just pick a definition because it's not that important what it is. We're looking at syntax now. So from this point on, right after these three lines have been input, three star star four becomes the legal expression. It would not have been before the infix declaration here, right? So star star becomes an infix operator. Right? It can has, have operands on the left and on the right. It can also be used as a cut. So if I put it in brackets, it becomes the function which can be applied to two arguments, and it will perform exactly the same computation, right? It can also be used as a cut by specifying one argument and leaving the other one outside, right? So I can say let f be 3 star star, right? So f becomes what? This argument is missing, so this f becomes the function that expects that missing argument. And we can see it here, right? that f accepts an argument and will perform 3 star star 4. So this thing, this expression here will perform 3 star star 4. Um, right? It's interesting to, to find out now wh what is the uh, precedence. So if we say 3 star star 4 plus 1, uh, we get the value, oh, not 20, 20 25. We get the value 26, which means that the, the uh, computation is performed like this. Right, the star star is performed first and plus is performed later, which means that this declaration will place, the, will make the operator the most, always the, the highest precedence, will make the new operator almost the high, always the highest precedence. We can always use brackets and change the order of evaluation, right? And if we try 
to use the operator in an associative manner, we get an error. Why? We have not specified we have not specified associativity, right? So of course we can tackle the ambiguity with brackets. Now the thing is that using too many brackets is always inconvenient, so we can actually specify associativity and we can also specify precedence. So instead of just saying in fix star star, so now the star star has been defined and I don't want to clobber it, right? So I'm going to define a new operator, triple star, right? But this one, notice the changes in the declaration. There's an L here, right? And there's a precedence level here, nine. Nine is the lowest precedence level. One is the highest. We don't have from one to 1200, as in Prolog, we only have from one to nine in Haskell, all right? And this will be make this operator, triple star, left associative and at the lowest level of precedence. And we define it by an equation exactly here. And we give it a different definition. doesn't quite matter what we write. There. The important thing is now, without writing any brackets, right, the operator associates by itself. The left, of course, as expected, because that's how it was declared, right? And um, if we want a different kind of associativity, we can use brackets. Also, we can verify that the operator is at the lowest level of precedence. So we can say 1 plus 5, right? And this will be computed first, uh, right? So it becomes 2 to 5. Oh, in this one, I, I probably forgot brackets. So I can, if I use this, right, I'll get 65. Uh, sorry for the typo. So there's brackets there. Uh, alternatively, we could have defined it right associative with infix r. Infix simple infix is non-associated. Now, if uh, in the context of monads, which we're not covering, but there's such a concept in Haskell called monads, which really makes Haskell a very useful language, we can actually, because of all these uh, uh, um, uh, syntax declaration, operator declaration, we can embed in Haskell a procedural language. We can embed it. We can have it executing, not write an interpreter for it as we did in Pro. Right? Just that this is a bit advanced, right? It would, we would not have room for it here. Um, all right, but we can, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe I'll post a link in the forum so we can look at procedural programming written in language, and you're going to wonder, where did they come from? Well, it came from operator declarations and cleverly defined monads, right? And uh, um, you can write programs pretty much like this, while, let's say, x is less than 1, uh, open brace. I can't remember whether there's a do here. I think there's a do here, open brace. And then you can say i, arrow, i plus 1, semicolon, uh, a, arrow uh, a plus 2. The arrow stands for assignment, and the semicolon stands for separator. And um, well, this arrow that is defined here is in fact a function, right? That does what? Takes a notion of a state <laughs> and transforms it, right? So this entire expression becomes a state transformer. And this is function composition, actually, right? Uh, and, and the, the semicolon is a separator, so the last statement should not have a semicolon. So, you know, uh, advanced stuff, you can check it on your own. Lists in Haskell. Uh, simple column is the list constructor. Empty list is empty square brackets. Um, and the list type is this, where A is a type variable, right? So I can fill it up with any other type and concretize this to the type. We have accessors to the list, which are head and tail. Right head will return the head of the list. Tail will return um, the tail of the list. They're the equivalent of car and pitter in scheme. Right? Enumeration of elements goes like this. List append is the plus plus operator. Okay. And once we have lists, we can start thinking of higher order programming. Again, these are procedures that you have seen 
and we have had quite a few examples and we're going to have more of them so I'm not going to tell you too much on this slide right uh, neither here uh, notice though because we're going to use later we have this two rather important functions which are going to be relevant in the context of lazy evaluation so take five will take the first n so given that this is a parameter k the first k elements of a list right and drop k will remove the first elements of the list and return the rest right this is how it works and remember that because we're going to see these functions again list comprehensions also a very important and interesting feature right we can define the list x such that x comes from this list and x modulo 2 is 0 so this is a implementation of a filtering procedure right in fact we don't really need the filter procedure in Haskell because we have list comprehensions right this is sort of an identity list comprehension so this uh, list is also the result okay we can use multiple comprehensions inside right x comes from a list y comes from a list and we write here the sum of the elements okay and um, um, obviously we uh, this will allow uh, a lot more uh, convenient ways of writing repetitive functions like factorial for instance can be defined as fold um, so the product of a list can be defined as fold r with multiplication and uh, first element one and then if we apply prod to list one to x we get the factorial right so it will uh, simplify some of the programs okay and the interesting aspect once we get to uh, a higher order programming is the types of the expressions okay so let's see when i map one plus to a list i'm going to list get a list of integers right so this is a list of integers integers in brackets means the type is a list of integers what's the type of map the type of map is function from a to b this is the first argument second argument is the list of a's and the return value is a list of b's right we have only worked with functions that work from integer to integer but in general the types of f do not need to be the same f takes some type a and returns some type b however what does map do well takes an entire list of a's applies f to each of them and if f goes from a to b then the result should be a list of b's so this type and this type must be the same and this type and this type must be the same in map okay so that's what we're saying we're saying that there's a pattern of the type and then there are certain certain placeholders in there but some of these placeholders must be filled with the same values once I do map one plus so once I write this expression, what would be the type of this expression? Well, you see, in map, this type has been filled with the type of 1 plus. 1 plus is numeric to numeric. So we're saying, what, what, what remains? Right, maybe, maybe I'm cluttering there, right? So you see, this is map. This is the first argument. Now map is applied to an argument. When map is applied to an argument, this expression must have what as a type? Something of this form, right? I have already filled this guy. So this is what remains, right? And that you see here. But also, when I have filled this guy, one plus, right the input and the output have the same type and that type must be numeric right so a 
right? The type of the input list must be the same as A, the type of the output list. And this A must be a numeric type, because otherwise I couldn't do an, a one plus on it. Okay? Now, for us later, this will be not important. We will try to derive from, from this, we will try to derive this, and we will forget about the numeric class. What is the type of plus? Well, I take a number and another number and return a number. So you see, and if I take an integer and another integer, I need to return an integer. If I take a double and another double, I need to return a double, right? So these three types, input, first input, second input, and result must be the same, and all of them must be numeric, right? Once I say fault plus, right? Why don't I say that this is zero? Zero is an integer, all right? So the result will also be an integer, right? Look at the type of fold right. Takes a function, so this is the function. This is the function. This is the type of that function. Takes a first element. This is the type of that first element. Takes a list. This is the type of that list. And returns a result. Right? Now, obviously, obviously, fold R will take an element of the list, right, and combines the element of the list with the first, the initial argument, right? So it has to be from A to B. And then it has to do that again. So the result of, of, of F, of this function here, has to be the same. And this has to be the same, right? So it's specifying a correspondence of types. OK? So there are many examples here. And I'm not going to look at all of them, right? We are going to look at the type language. But maybe another one would be interesting. So let's try to get let's try to get yet another one, which is right. Because you see, we can we can build pretty complicated expressions, right? So for instance, let let's get this one, right? So a function that takes two arguments x and y and returns y. Right? So I can't make any assumption of x and type of x and y, right? So they, they must be as general as possible. So I, I'm going to say that x has type A and B has type and, and y has type B. I'm going to invent some type variables for these two arguments. But then since I'm returning y, the return type must be the same as the return type as the type of y. So the return type must be B. Okay? All right. Type language. So uh, it's a type constant like int. It's a type variable like a. And it can be a function type, right? Type of the argument, type of the result, right? In, constants are in Boolean whatever. Type variable is uh, um, uppercase letter. Why do I say uppercase letter? Um, because I'm going to show you a type checker in Prolog later. Actually, this. Haskell is lowercase letter. So sorry for that. Expression is what? Is a constant, is a variable, is applying a function to an argument, all right? And is a lambda abstraction, backslash variable expression, right? So this is the language. Constants are 0, 1, true, false, uh, plus is a constant, right? We're not going to write 2 plus 3. Right, because it's too complicated, and this is shortcut for plus two, three, two. Right, so we're not going to do the operator thing. We're going to keep things simple. And then a type assignment is expression, type operator, type. So we're saying that one is of type n, one, four, so double colon n, uh, and backslash x goes to x is of type A to A, right? So we're going to say backslash x, x is of type A to A, right? That's, that's the use of this operator. OK? And we're going to define the type inference algorithm via judgments, right? Typing judgments, as we did before. 
And how does a judgment look like? We have an environment and we have a set of type constraints. And we're going to see exactly how this works. And in this constant con context of a environment and a set of constraints, we can infer that expression E has type P. All right, so remember that. What we want to derive in the end is that an expression E has type P. And we're going to set a set of axioms. You see there's no premises for all the basic constructs, right? So we have all the constants. True is going to be Boolean with no context. I don't need a constant context to infer that. False is also going to be Boolean, right? Uh, plus, sorry, int, int, int. Plus is going to be uh, type int to int to int with no context. It's a constant. It's pretty fine. Now, the interesting thing is what happens with, uh, um, with a uh, uh, constant. Um, this is variable. Oh, this is, this is awful. Sorry. <laughs> so we're going to say the following, that if x, if x is a new variable, never encountered before, right? Right? I can assume a completely new type for that variable, provided that I record that in my environment. Okay? What am I going to do if I encounter a new variable? I'm going to assume it has a new type. I'm going to invent a type variable for the program variable. Okay? Now, Let's say I have this expression E1 to E2. From previous inferences, I can I have already I already know that E1 is of type T1, and I have done that in this context, and E2 is of type T2. Now I'm going to juxtapose E1 and E2, right? It's E1 applied to E2. E1 is a function, and E2 is an argument. For instance, I can say backslash x x apply to 3, right? This is my E1, this is my E2. And I already know that E1 has type T1, E2 has type T2. Well, it must be the case, it must be the case that this T1 is a functional type of the form T2 to T3. I, I couldn't apply it if it's not an arrow. If the type of this guy is not an arrow, I couldn't apply it, right? So I know that this type is, oops, is, um, is T1. But actually T1 is not specific enough, right? So this must be some, this, this type is T2, right? Since this is the argument, in order to accept T2 as an argument, I must have a T2 arrow something, right? Is this clear? Arrow to what? I don't know. So I'm going to invent a new type variable T3 here. So this is going to be a new, a C or a D, some letter that I haven't seen before, right? T3 is a new type variable. So how do we make this inference? Well, everything that was inferred here must still be valid. Everything that was inferred here must still be valid. Moreover, it must be the case that T1 is of the form T2 goes to T3, where T3 is something I don't know yet. But T2 is something I know exactly what it is. It's whatever I have I came from here, right? So my constraints are growing. And when we look at these constraints, this is the prolog equality. So we're going to have a set of these kind of constraints, these kinds of unifications and think of them as being executed in prolog. It's exactly that. Let's look at the abstraction, right? So what do we have here, right? So here we have a single variable, and here we have an expression E, right? That contains this X. 
So I have the expression x plus 1. This is my e. And now I'm going to come and say backslash x goes to x plus 1. Well, since previously I was analyzing x plus 1, my context must contain a type for x. Right? So, I'm going to say that the type of x that I inferred from the standalone analysis of x and the type of x that I have inferred as a part of E, they must be the same. Right? And backslash x goes to E, right? This guy is of type T2. This guy is of type T1, right? Backslash x goes to E can only be of type T1 goes to T2. Right? So x plus 1 is of type int, but x inside is of type int. Backslash x goes to x plus 1 has to be int to int. Right? So I'm inferring the types. And this is all. All the rules. So let's go through a few examples. Okay? Now, when we go through these examples, we are assembling bigger expressions from smaller expressions. And we're going to look at the smaller expressions in isolation. So you see, in the end, I want to get the type of this. Right? What are the components? Well, 3 is a separate component, and backslash x goes to x is a separate component. So you can see them. I'm going to analyze in isolation 3. I'm going to analyze in isolation x goes to x. And when I analyze this one, this x is a separate component and this x is a separate component. So I'm going to ask, analyze them in isolation. Right? So I start from, I, I, I build bottom up. I start from the smallest components and I try to build them together to obtain the expression that I am after. So first time I'm going to look at x, sorry, x here. And x is a new variable I haven't seen before. Right? And... Um, um, Right, and, and let me let me uh, let me try to make clarify this even more. Right, let's say that these are different persons. Right, and these persons they analyze, and they, two, these two guys meet here, and join their effort, and these two guys meet here, and join their efforts. Right, but at the time this guy is analyzing, he's not aware of what this guy is doing. Right, so you're going to say, well, there's there's two x's there, and they're actually the same x. Well, the two x's belong to two different guys. The guys don't talk to each other at that point, don't talk to each other yet, right? So each of them is going to see a new x. So each of them is going to see a new x and is going to invent a new, a new type variable for them, right? I haven't seen x before. I'm going to assume that the type is t1. t1 is type variable that I haven't seen before. This guy is seeing x for the first time and it's assuming that the type is t2 type that it hasn't seen before then these two guys come together and they start exchanging information and they say well i have seen x with type t1 the other guy says i have seen x with type t2 but it's the same x so t1 and t2 must be the same type okay and uh, then we can create this new expression x goes to x which will be of type T1 to type T2, because it's X goes to X. This has type T1, this has type, type T2. But it's also the same X, so T1 is equal to T2. Right? And then the third guy comes along. He sees 3, and 3 is a constant, is of type int. Right? So when some guy takes over here, and they meet together at this point, right? So they're going to see, this guy sees, sees x to x, this guy sees int, and they will say, well, this x will become int here, 3, right? So the type of x, which is t1, better become int, right? And then we're going to get t3 uh, of type t2. And at this point, imagine a prologue interpreter executing this goal, t1 equals t2, t1 equals int, right? 
at that point, all the both types will become int, and consequently, this t2 will become int, so this expression has type int. All right? So we build up, we build up the type. This is the composition function. The composition function, right? So remember, f composed to g apply to x in mathematics, right? This is identical to f apply to g apply to x, right? The Haskell expression for this is backslash f goes to backslash g goes to backslash s x f apply to g apply to x, right? What's the type of this guy? It's going to eventually work out to be this, right? So we do the same kind of inferences. We're going to assume that G has type T1 prime, X has type C prime, and I'm, I'm putting all these primes because in the end I want to get this nice type, right? So I sort of work, work, work it out backwards, right? And I'm naming the type so that in the end I get a nice type later. Uh, so G is, I'm seeing it for the first time, I'm going to assume it's of type T1 prime. C, I'm seeing it for the first time, I'm going to assume that it's of some, some type C prime. And then when I apply G to X, I'm only then noticing that T1 prime must be a functional type, right? So T1 prime must be of type C prime goes to some A. A is, again, a new type I haven't seen before, right? Then the type of GX will be that new A. Now, I'm seeing F for the first time. So I'm going to assume that F is of, of some new type, T2 prime, right? And then I'm going to apply F to GX. So at this point, I will have to uh, 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 acknowledge the fact that T2 prime if, is of type A, the same type as here, and some new type B. All right? And then the resulting type is going to be B for this expression. Okay? And uh, again, uh, 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 these are like prolog prolog uh, uh, constraints, prolog unification uh, constraints. Then, and, and remember that inside F, inside the, the environment I have F, I have G, I have X of their assumed types. Then I'm going to see X again. And for the guy coming from this line, X is a new variable. So that guy is assuming that the type is some new type C. The type of X is some new type C. When we get them together, we will notice that the type of x, this, the x here and the x here are the same. So c must be the same as c prime, right? And then the type of backslash x goes to fgx, must be the type of x goes to the type of fgx. So c goes to b, all right? And we keep going. Then g is a variable that I'm seeing for the same time, for the first type. So I'm at a time, so I'm assuming t1 is a new variable. But then when I do backslash g, and you see this expression is the one that we have seen previously, right? I'm going to say that this expression has type from the type of g to the type of this expression that we have previously seen, right? So t1 goes to cb, okay? And uh, G is, in fact, the same on both sides, right? So the G that appears here is the same as the G that appears here. So T1 must be the same as T1 prime, okay? Finally, F is assumed of type T2. And then this is the previous expression from the right side. So I'm going to have F goes to previous expression of the right side. Right? So what's the type? It's the type of T2 arrow, the type T1 goes to CB of the expression that I had before. And because F is the same, right, I have to add this constraint. And now look at these constraints. And imagine them executed by a prolog interpreter. So we're going to see what? That uh, T1. So T1 is the same as T1 prime. T1 is the same as T1 prime. T1 prime is C prime goes to A. But C prime is C. So this guy is, in fact, C goes to A. 
T2 is the same as T2 prime. T2 prime is A goes to B, right? So T2 is the same as T2 prime, and T2 prime is A goes to B. So this T2 is this guy. So we finally infer the type that uh, for this composition. And now, right, maybe you don't believe me that is the correct type. So let's see what is Haskell saying about this. All right, so I'm going to, where's my Haskell? Right, so if I say type backslash um, F goes to backslash G um, goes to uh, backslash X goes to F applied to G X. Right? We're getting, well, different names, right? But T1 goes to T, T2 goes to T1, T2 goes to T, right? So we can say that this is A to B, and then this is A to C, and then this is uh, C to B, right? The name of the variables is not important as long as we have the correspondence, right? Obviously, this expression can be in Haskell. Haskell has this shortcut, right? We'll be getting the same thing. So in our language, we have not provided for this short shortcut. So remember, whenever we have backslash f g x, you have to think of backslash f goes to backslash g goes to backslash x in the low level language, okay? Um, so that's an important, an important um, aspect that we want to learn today, how to infer types. Now, I said no more prologue, but I couldn't resist. And why? For a very simple reason. Writing a type inference program in prologue is straightforward. It's almost immediate. Right? So I think this is the next, the next topic. Oh, this is where it fails. And then we have a prologue type checker demo. So let's do that. All right, so I've, I've uploaded this. You can play with it yourselves. And hopefully you'll understand the whole thing better. OK? There's a lot of comments, so hopefully that will help. And this is it, the it lines. That's all we need to implement a type checker in Prolog. OK? So we have the rule for uh, functional abstraction, backslash x goes to y. The type of this, so this is the expression. It follows the rules as we did before, right? Previously, we have uh, built prolog programs from reasoning rules by just following the rules. And uh, so it, uh, it, this is the expression. This is the type of that expression that we want to compute. There's an environment the type environment, we don't need to keep track of the constraints, of the type constraints, of the T1 is arrow, uh, is A arrow C prime, right? Why is that? Because Prolog can execute those immediately, right? So you, you'll see that uh, uh, done in a minute, um, right? And we're going to keep track of a set of predefined constants. We don't want the constants to be given by, in, by, um, by um, individual rules because it will make the program too big. Okay? So you're going to see here the list of predefined constants that we have come up with, that I have come up with, right? So this is a list of predefined constants with their types, right? And this list is injected here. Okay? Now, we keep track of the type environment. So every new variable that we encounter gets a new type, and that type is recorded in the environment. Okay? So what we do here for abstraction, we get the type of x, 
to BTX, right, recursively, and that will produce some environment L1. Right? P is always constant. It never changes, right? It is just passed down. It's a list of constants. So P never, um, P never changes. It will be the fourth argument will always be the same P everywhere. Then the type of Y is TY, and in computing that, we create a type environment L2. And then, and then, what happens if I have abstraction? Backslash x goes to expression, and this expression has uh, has a type for x. X is of type t and some other types, right? And from here, I want to get that x is of type t1, right? So one thing that we need to do is t1 is the same as t, but then the environment of this guy does not contain x anymore. Why not? Because it's a closed expression. x is only defined inside. It's not defined outside. So what I want to do is the resulting environment should be one that copies everything from here but leaves x outside. x is removed from the, the environment of the expression, right? Because x is not defined outside of that expression. If I say backslash x goes to e, x is local to e, and x does not exist outside that expression, right? So we remove it. And this is a difference set, uh, uh, set difference predicate, right? It considers L1 to be a set. It considers L2 to be a set. It removes uh, L1 from L2, and the result is L, and the result is what we put here, right? In the process of removals, it also says that the type of x from L1 should be the same as the type of x from L2. And this is why we don't have to keep track of the constraints. Now, we're also allowing, we didn't discuss, but we're also allowing recursive definitions. So recursive definitions will be uh, x is equal to expression that contains x. Okay? And... Uh, um, it's, uh, it's similar, right? So we're going to find the type of E, which is T. The type of A, F equals E, is the same. But then the environment should not have a binding for F anymore. F is local to E. All right? Application E1 applied to E2 has a type T, right? Provided that E1 has... Some t1 goes to t, all right? And notice that t is a new variable. And e2 has some type t1. And then when we have this situation, we have to produce an environment that is the union of the two environments, okay? The rest of the rules are uh, uh, quite uh, simple, right? So uh, if x is a uh, uh, integer, right, a constant, uh, right, the type is int, provided that x is an integer. Uh, all right, so this is the uh, x may be a pretty fine symbol. Uh, look at this expression. Three marks in the final exam, three extra marks in the final exam, if you can tell me why this expression is necessary. I'm going to delete it from there and show you what happens if it's not there, and then you tell me exactly what happens when I put it there. Okay? For the time being, remember this. What we're, we're checking, essentially, is whether X is a member, XT is a member of P. So, fresh P is sort of a copy of P. Okay? I'm going to delete that and show you what happens, and then uh, you'll have to investigate on your own. Uh, everything else is syntactic sugar. So, this is a new variable. And when I have a new variable, I will have a new type here, t. And if is converted into this expression, syntactic sugar, we want in our uh, uh, type checker, we want normal expressions. We want to write 2 plus 3 and not plus apply to 2 and 3. Now, uh, uh, what, I, what I haven't uh, emphasized is that we can't have the luxury of having an invisible application operator. So the application operator is visible, and it's this at. 
I'm writing x at y to signify x is applied to y. I can't say x space y. Prolog will not let me do that. All right, and then all the infix operators, they're converted, right? So if you write, if we write two plus three, we're going to convert it into plus applied to two applied to three, right? So we're going to take advantage of that. All the binary operators and all the unary operators, also here, will be converted via syntactic sugar. So I'm um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, okay, let's run. Actually, it has run, right? So let's see some results here. They, they have already been printed. So this expression is the composition, right? Okay. And uh, notice the type. And the variables look kind of ugly, right? But if I look carefully at the names, so I can say that this is type A, this is type B, this is type C, this is again type A, this is again type C, and this is again type B, right? So, yeah, Prolog is not very nice in inventing names for us. Nevertheless, the type is correct. Now, in the next goals, I'm applying a trick to give nice names to these, right? So now, if you see, this expression is also the function composition but apply it to an argument, right? And you're going to see now, right, A, B, A, B. This would be the type, right? Let's look at factorial. So factorial would be defined as factorial equals backslash x. If x is 0, then 1, else x times factorial apply to x minus 1. So this is the type, okay? And it is int to int because int is a constant, right? And, and uh, because I'm using minus, if I'm using uh, multiplication and minus, this will constrain the type of x to being integer, right? Map, defined in this way, right? Map is backslash f, backslash l. If l is the empty list, then empty list, else. f is applied to head, applied to l. And we don't have the luxury of pattern matching. So I can't write here x followed by xs instead of l. Right? So then I will access the head of L with a specific function, and I will access the tail of L with a specific function. Right? So this is the definition of map, and this is the type, which we have seen before. This is the definition of fold L, this is the type, definition of fold R, and this is the type. All right? Now, so I want you to use this to learn type inference. And there will be such questions in the uh, final exam as to this is the expression, give me the time. So we won't have any more prologue problem sets, right? This type checker is given to you, this prologue type checker is given to you just as a supplement for the reasoning rules, right? But since you already know prologue, it'll probably help for you to play with it a bit to understand how it works. Okay. Now, I'm going to delete that line. Where is it? So instead of copying the term, I'm going to use the existing copy all right and I'm going to replace this with P so I'm running it and then look at map what changed what was the type of, of map previously What was the type of map previously? Oh, it disappeared. Seems to have disappeared. So it was A to B, list A to list B, right? So it's still sort of correct, but it's more restricted than it should be, right? 
And that's only that's just because of that copy. Um, copy term. Right? So remember that. So if you have the answer why this copy term is relevant, this one here, send me an email. And if the answer is correct, you get three more marks in the final exam, which could boost your grade, right? Could be enough to boost your grade. Okay. So, so that you know, this uh, this uh, piece of code doesn't completely go to waste. Some of you could still uh, get some benefit out of it. All right. Any questions so far? So my my uh, my um, uh, advice is that you would probably find it easier to understand the prolog code than to understand the rules. All right. But the rules, the prolog code and the rules are the same. Okay, just that with the with the prolog code, yes. Uh, so the uh, I'm I'm going to so one type of of of, uh, of question is going to be this is the expression give me the type or this is the type give me an expression that has the type. All right. So you have to acquire that understanding. Okay. All right, lazy evaluation. So, uh, benefits of being lazy. Have you ever found any? Actually, I have. I have found. You know, I I have often been in the situation where uh, I said I'll do it later, and later I found out that it wasn't necessary to do it anymore. Right? Whatever was there to do, I said, well, I should do this. Then you know I don't have the time to do this, or I don't. Have, I'm not in the mood. Then one week later, it's not all, no longer necessary. So if I had done it one week before, I would have wasted my time, right? Um, so this is what laziness is about. When you don't completely, absolutely sure, you're not absolutely sure that you need to perform a computation, don't do it. Only do it when at the last minute, when it's when you're absolutely sure uh, that the computation is needed. Right. Let's uh, let's showcase let's showcase this concept. Right. So first of all, how do we write a infinite loop in Haskell? Very easy. This is an infinite loop. Fx is equal to fx, and we call it, and it starts running, and we have to press Control C to interrupt it. Right. And uh, it, it will it will show up. I mean, it will be an infinite loop anywhere you put it, right? So you can say fx fx in a list one plus two. So you see Haskell tries to give it the first element, and then when it tries to compute the second element of the list, it goes into infinite loop, right? So it starts the computation, prints the first element, and then it becomes it goes into infinite loop. So it has to be interrupted. Um, but but this is an infinite loop, you see, and look at this expression, right? It's the head applied to a list whose second element is the implementation of the, the concretization of the infinite loop, right? Yet the program doesn't go into infinite loop. You'd expect it to do that. Why? Because in general, you're saying this is a function. This is the argument to the function. The argument needs to be evaluated first and completely before calling the function, right? But that's not what happens in Haskell. Haskell will keep this as an expression. It will say, I'm seeing this argument. I don't know whether I should evaluate it first because I'm not sure whether it's needed or not. Let me get to the point where it's really needed, and then I'm going to decide whether to compute it or not, okay? So it goes inside this function. This function accesses the first element of the list, 
So Haskell says, let me evaluate the first element of the list, 1 plus 2, and then print it out. And then the head function does not access the second element of the list. The second element of the list is not computed. So this expression, which goes into infinite loop, is never evaluated. And the code does not go into infinite loop. This is the essence of laziness. All right? So if you didn't know how to be lazy, you're finding out now. This is the right way to be lazy. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so we can we can we can do more of this, right? So uh, uh, infinite loop argument. You would expect this argument to be evaluated first and trigger the infinite loop, but it's not what happens, right? Look what's happening here. If x is zero. Then we evaluate A, else we evaluate B. X is not 0, it's 1, right? Then A is never evaluated, only B. The infinite loop is never triggered. Okay? So essentially, if is what tells you whether something will be computed or not, right? When you have an if statement, it's not the case that both branches will be executed, only one. Whatever is in the correct branch, that's what's going to be evaluated, right? And you only know when you evaluate the condition. So everything that appears in branches of an if will not be evaluated up front, will be delayed until it is exactly know which branch will execute. And then whatever is in that branch will be evaluated, and whatever is in the other branch will not be evaluated. OK? Now, this leads to the very interesting concept of infinite lists. This is the list at, that starts at 1 and it never ends. Right? And if I would put this, I would try to evaluate this at the prompt, right at the prompt, if I write 1 dot dot, right, you may try it. It starts printing and it never ends. But the take function only takes the first 10 elements. If only 10 elements are needed, only 10 elements will be evaluated from the list. So 10 elements are printed out. The rest of the list is not evaluated, even though the potential for evaluating it, it is still there, right? And the infinite list, the infinite uh, loop is not triggered. So this is the essence of, of um, uh, evaluation. It's also known as on-demand evaluation. The opposite of laziness is called strict. And that's most of the languages, right? Most of the languages are uh, strict. And you'll see that it leads to very interesting, very interesting um, kind of computation. Now, how is it implemented? Sort of an idea, right? Remember the call by name that we have discussed a while ago? We discussed call by value, call by reference, call by name, right? So this is an instance of call by name. The list, the argument is not evaluated, but is passed inside a function, right? And whenever the the formal argument is encountered, right? If it is need to, be, if it needs to be computed, that's when the expression of the actual argument is computed. But it is memoized, so Haskell is efficient. It will not try to evaluate it twice. It will evaluate the expression and store the result, memoize the result. That's the term. The result will be memoized. Subsequent access to the same expression will just use the stored result and not evaluate the expression again. This creates a problem. Right? Why is that? Because some functions, you call them the first time, they give you one result. You call them a second time with the same argument because of side effects inside. They give you another result, right? And in some some uh, languages, in some in some solutions, it is important that this happens. You want the function to first time return you an argument, and later to return a different argument, and third time to return yet a different argument, right? There's some state hidden inside the function that will contribute to the result. Well, guess what? In Haskell, that's not possible because every function with the same argument will only be called once. You're calling f applied to three. Every future reference to F3 will use the memoized result. F3 will never be called again. You may call F4 and trigger a new evaluation, 
But F3 will never call, be called twice. Okay? Which is why, for instance, the Fibonacci, where you have Fib of K plus Fib K minus 1, right? Or Fib K minus 1, Fib K minus 2. This is typically exponential. Guess what? In Haskell, is linear. Because you called, you called Fib 3. You're going to call it again later, but the result is memoized. It's already there. Fib 3 will never be called twice. Every second access or subsequent access to Fib 3 will use the memoized result. Okay? That's a very interesting uh, <laughs> aspect. And it's important for laziness. Because you want to use, be using call by name, but you also want to be efficient, right? And this is the real reason why assignment has been banned from Haskell. Because you don't want side effects. If you had side effects, it becomes confusing, right? You can write a function with side effects where you expect multiple different results for the same argument. But Haskell will never call a function twice, right? So then it, it makes no sense to have assignment. Okay, so remember that. So, purity is the a concept related to side effects. So if we have side effects, we're impure. If we don't have side effects, we are pure. Haskell is the only pure language um, that I know of, right? Assignment is removed, Haskell becomes a pure language, and a pure language is, um, uh, can have lazy evaluation as a mainstream concept. Many other languages have lazy evaluation as a side concept. You can bring a library that uses uh, uh, lazy evaluation, but you can't um, have it as a mainstream um, as a mainstream uh, 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 feature. Okay. So remember, pure versus impure. So now. The really interesting thing when you have uh, laziness is to use streams, which are also infinite, called infinite lists, right? So it's very easy to compute with the infinite list as long as the last thing we do is take a finite amount of infinite list, right? So we, we have an entire program that, that passes around infinite lists, but the last thing you, you do is take finite length of that infinite list and then you never have a uh, um, a uh, infinite loop. All right. So this gives what? Well, allows recursive specification of um, of some computations and doesn't need a base case. And because of that lack of a base case, the expression looks nicer. It's more elegant. So this would be the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are 0, 1, and zip with <coughs> fib, tail fib, right? So 0, 0, 1. So I already know two numbers of Fibonacci, right? So here I start writing Fibonacci because the third element starts from zip with. The third element is Fibonacci. So the first element of Fibonacci is 0. And tail Fibonacci. Tail Fibonacci starts here, right? So I have a 1. And I add them together and I get a 1. So now I know the third element. Uh, the, the, the the third element of the um, uh, stream, right? So now I can do one, one, two. So now I know the fourth element of the stream. So now I can do two plus one is three. And now I know yet one more element, right? So this is the result. This is this fib, and this one is this fib, right? And the computation continues as and it's infinite. I don't need to specify a base case. Actually, sort of, we do specify the base case here, right? So this becomes a recursive expression that specifies the stream of Fibonacci numbers, right? And it's essential that at the end, I only take a finite amount of them. All right, sorry, I'm going to finish. So it's, uh, yeah, just a couple more slides. Powers of 2. 1 followed by map 2 times power of 2, right? So I will have 1, right? So I know the first element. So this one. Then, what's the second element? Well, I, 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 I need to take one 
And I know the first element, and I'm going to multiply it by 2. So I'm going to have a 2 here. And now I know the second element. So I'm multiply this by, by 2, I get 4. I know the next element here. I'm going to multiply it by 2, I get 8. And I do this. I do this infinitely. But in the end, take only a finite number of them. You can just take one element, right? You can say power 2, uh, 10. And you're going to get the 10th element, which is 2 to the power of 9, right? So this becomes yet another interesting way of computing various things. Um, approximations to square root of 2, right? So we have this stream of approximations, xn equals x plus 2 divided to xn minus 1, 2 divided by uh, x n minus 1, 1 divided by 2 in front, right? So if I start with some approximation, let's say 1, right, and I inject the current approximation into this expression, I get the next approximation, right? That's how it works. So now I can use this to create the stream of approximations of the square root of 2. Right, so how do I do this? I take this expression and I recursively apply it to square root of 2, right? So then I'm going to get this stream of approximations to the square root of 2. Infinite, and essentially, it's, it's essential that at the end I take a finite number of them. Okay, so we're going to come up in the tutorial with a lot of examples, well, as long as we have time. Prime numbers, prime numbers, right? So it's a filtering of this infinite list. Right? So we can write it like this. It's, a, it's a, the first prime number, and then uh, uh, we are using excess um, C, C recursively, right? To, um, to, to get, to get a, uh, so we get a list from which we remove the multiples of 3, and then from that list we remove further the multiples of, four, of uh, 5, and then the multiples of uh, 7 and so on. Okay, so it's essential that every time when we remove, we don't, so we don't go to, from removing, we remove the multiples of 2, the multiples of 3, I don't need to remove the number, the multiples of 4, right? So what, the, when I remove multiples, what the multiples of, I, should, I need to take them recursively from the primes. Right, I don't want to remove the multiples of 4 because they were already removed when I removed the multiples of 2. And do you know the Hamming numbers problem? So yeah, we have to produce, and we're going we're gonna to look at it in more uh, detail maybe in the tutorial. We have to produce the list of multiples of 2, 3, and 5 in increasing order, each occurring only once. So this is a problem that doesn't have an elegant solution in most languages. All right? This is the Haskell solution, right? And it has the property that it produces at most two more numbers than there are necessary. Because the problem here is that if you want to take 20 numbers, how do you know where to stop? So in most languages with strict evaluation, you would do what? 20 multiples of 2, 20 multiples of 3, 20 multiples of 5 to be on the safe side. You merge them together, you get a list of 60 numbers, and you take the first 20 of them, right? So the overproduced 40 numbers. Well, this one, because of laziness, will produce exactly two more. Right? Because it will have one number from here, one number from here, one number from here. One guy makes it into the result. This guy is recomputed. And at all times, you have the first element of, the, of all the lists, of the multiples of 2, multiples of 3, multiples of 5. And you pick one, and that one that gets recomputed. So you have, at most, two extra ones. <laughs> OK? Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about this one uh, more, but it's, it's the killer app for lazy uh, evaluation because it's an extremely uh, clear and concise expression of this computation. Thanks. Sorry for keeping you, and, and sorry for uh, you know, being so late. See you next time. Let's get out of here.